All right, students, let's talk about complex ionic compounds. This is kind of a continuation from last module where we learned about simple ionic compounds. So let's get started with the notes. Please pull out your notebook or piece of paper and write this essential question at the top. How do you write ionic compounds with transition metals and polyatomic ions? First, let's talk about a little bit of a review. What's a compound? Well, you might recall that a compound is a substance made from two or more different types of elements that are chemically bonded. Now, we've, we're learning about two different types of compounds. One of them are called ionic compounds or ionic bonds. And we learned about simple ones last week. We're gonna learn about complex ones this week. Now, we'll learn about covalent compounds in a future module. So just sit back on those ones for now. All right, so just a little quick preview about simple versus complex. Simple, as we learned last time, are just basically two different types of elements that are combined together. So for example, magnesium and chlorine can combine together to make magnesium chloride, which is a really simple ionic compound. Now, complex ionic compounds have a few weird things to them, such as exceptions. One of those exception, ex exceptions is transition metals. If we see a transition metal in there, there's a weird certain thing we need to do to change the ionic compound. Next thing is a polyatomic ion, which we'll talk about what that is, but if we see polyatomic ions, that's another weird thing we have to deal with with a little bit more complex ionic compounds. Before I talk about those, let's talk and review about charges. If you remember on the periodic table, hopefully you wrote these down on your periodic table, but elements and families have standard charges for the most part. Like the alkali metals have a plus one charge. The alkali earth metals have a plus two. Notice all the metals are positively charged. The nonmetals over here are negatively charged. So if it's a metal, it's positive. If it's a nonmetal, it's negative. And for the most part, they have set charges. Now, if you remember, ionic compounds come together, so their ratio of charges cancel each other out. So using magnesium and chlorine, for example, if you remember, magnesium has a charge of plus two. So magnesium has a charge of plus two, typically when it wants to bond. Chlorine, on the other hand, has a charge of minus one. Now, if you were just to have one of each of those elements, they would not cancel out. Their charges don't cancel. So in order for this compound to work, in order to create an ionic compound between magnesium and chlorine, there needs to be two chlorines attached to the magnesium. So the total charge is canceled out. So that's kind of a standard thing for ionic compounds and an important thing to talk about when we get to the next two types of complex ionic compounds. Now if you look here there's a bunch of elements on the periodic table that are missing their charge. Well what about these guys right? These are called the transition metals and even some of these other metals over here don't have charges. How do we deal with them? Well let's talk about transition metals and I'm going to include other metals in this as well. Transition metals can have variable charges. That's why we can't write it on the periodic table. There's not one standard charge. They can have multiple different charges. So for example, copper can be a plus two charge or copper can be a plus one charge. So how do we know which is which? Well, it kind of has to be told to you in one way or another. So here we might put a plus two and we would know that it's called copper with the Roman numerals two. Or if we gave you the name copper with Roman numerals one, then we know that's a copper with a plus one. So we designate the charge of transition metals and, and the other metals that we don't know the charge of with Roman numerals. Now, if there, if we know that it's a transition metal and other, other, other metal and we don't know the charge and there's no Roman numerals, then we can just assume one. Uh, and if you're struggling with Roman numerals, here's all the Roman numerals you're going to need to know for chemistry, basically one through six. You're welcome to write these or encouraged to, to write them on your periodic table if you struggle with Roman numerals one through six. All right, so here's a little prompt. I want, I want you guys to pause this video right now and see if you can answer this question based on what we just learned. What is the name of the following compound? Now, we need to apply the naming rule that we learned in the last module. Typically, we name the metal, then we name the nonmetal, and end in eyed. But for this, there's a transition metal, so we need to figure out what the charge of the transition metal is. So pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Did you pause it? Did you try it? We learn the best by trying and failing a little bit. I'll help you out. If you did, great. Let's take a look here. Some of you probably looked on the periodic table for the charge of iron and it doesn't tell you because iron does not have a set charge. It has a variable charge. It could be any charge, but in this compound, it does have a specific charge. So how do we know what it is? Well, we don't know the charge of iron, but we do know the charge of oxygen. Oxygen on the periodic table, oxygen always wants to become negative two charged when it attaches to things. So that's one thing we do know about oxygen. 
Another thing we know about oxygen here in this compound is that there are three of them. So there are three oxygens, each with a charge of minus two. So that's off to a good start. We know that the total of the negative charge is negative six. Now, how about the irons? We don't know what the charge of an individual iron is, but we do know that there are two irons. So we would need to split this up so that there are two. And those two irons have to cancel out the oxygens. So the total of the irons has to be positive six. So did you figure out yet what the charge of an iron is? Well, the charge of each iron is plus three. And so that's important information. The irons in this compound are each plus three and the oxygens are minus two. They cancel each other out. So the name of this compound is iron Roman numerals three oxide. I just wanna give you a quick warning. Here's some misconceptions that I see a lot that students do that are bad, basically. So if you look here, let's say I gave you the name iron three oxide. I've seen some students write the formula Fe with a Roman numerals three and O. Never, ever, ever include Roman numerals in a in a chemical formula or a chemical equation. Roman numerals only belong in the name, the compound name. Also, I've seen students use Roman numerals to represent the quantity of iron or whatever that transition metal is, and that is also incorrect. This three right here does not represent that there are three irons in the compound. Remember, this represents that the charge of iron is plus three, right? And so if we know the charge of both of our things in our ionic compound, then we can figure out how many irons or how many oxygens there are based on that rule of zero charge. So don't fall into those mistakes that I see students make commonly. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about polyatomic ions. Now, polyatomic ions are a little bit scary to begin with, but they're really not that hard to deal with. You just need to realize that polyatomic ions are basically compounds that have an overall charge. Now that's really weird if you think about it. We've just been talking about how all of our compounds have charges that cancel. So technically the compounds should not have a charge, but for some reason or another, there are certain compounds that when formed in life still have a charge. One, one example of that is phosphate. So PO4 is a compound and that compound is called phosphate. Now this phosphate compound has an overall charge of minus three. So we would treat that as one piece with a minus three charge. Another example of that is hydroxide. So hydroxide is OH, that's a compound. Now this OH compound has an overall charge of negative one. So we can use these compounds in an ionic compound to create basically an ionic bond. So we're going to, let me show you an example of that in the next in the next couple of slides. First off, before I do that, please know I don't expect you to know what these polyatomic ions are by by memorization. Um, I don't even know what they are. Typically, you have to look up a list of polyatomic ions. So on your periodic table is a list of all the common polyatomic ions we would use and their charge. There's no way to figure out what their charges are without looking them up on this table, or what the compound is without looking it up on this table. So be aware that this table exists exists, have it out in front of you when you're doing your practice problems. All right, so let's take a look at polyatomic ions and how they how they how they work in an ionic compound. So if you take a look here, I have basically two compounds that I want to make. I want to make a compound between aluminum, which is an element, a metal, and selenium, which is just another element and it's a nonmetal. Now we've done these before. If we know that aluminum is positive three and selenium is negative two, do you know how many you would need of each in order to make a compound? Well, if you figured out that you need two aluminums and three seleniums in order to make a compound between the two, you'd be correct. Their charges cancel out. So let's take a look at aluminum and sulfate. Now notice aluminum still has a charge of plus three. If I look at my table, sulfate has a charge of minus two. It's the same charge as selenium. So we're gonna apply the same principle. If we make a compound between aluminum and sulfate, there's gonna be two aluminums, and then I'm gonna put sulfate in parentheses and put three on the outside. So this is works the exact same way as a regular ionic compound or a simple ionic compound. So polyatomic ions are really no different. The bottom one is just a general form, right? Any kind of the main key idea here is polyatomic ions are treated the same as elements with the same charge.
All right, so how do we name ionic compounds with polyatomic ions? Well, polyatomic ions, we just use the name that's written on the periodic table. So we really need to have that list in order to know how to name things. We don't typically change the ending to "-ide", unless the list on the periodic table says that the ending is "-ide". So here's a couple examples. Ammonium chloride is NH4, that's ammonium, and then Cl is chlorine, but we change the ending to "-ide", because it's not a polyatomic ion. BNO32 is beryllium nitrate. So NO3 is called the nitrate, and BE is beryllium. So I follow the periodic table, and I name it beryllium nitrate. NaOH, so OH on the periodic table is a hydroxide. So I'm going to call this sodium hydroxide. This one does end in ide, so it's pretty typical, but it's not an element. It's a polyatomic ion. Some students get really confused about whether we understand, whether we know, or how we know polyatomic ions are in a compound. Here's two hints. If you are looking at the chemical equation and you see more than two elements, then that is a, there's a polyatomic ion in there and you should refer to the polyatomic ion list. If you see a name and it includes a non-element or things that don't end in ide, then that those are examples of polyatomic ions. For example, there's no element named ammonium. There's also no element named nitrate. There's a nitride, which is nitrogen, but nitrate, the ending doesn't end in ide, so that's weird. Hydroxide does end in ide, but there's no element called hydromium or hydronium or anything like that. So hydroxide has to be a polyatomic ion. All right, so here's another thought prompt for you. How are sodium phosphate and sodium phosphide written differently? You might want to pause this video to see if you can figure out the chemical equation for each of those. Remember, one of them is a polyatomic ion and the other one is not. So sodium phosphate, remember the ending eight suggests that this is not a normal element. It's a polyatomic ion. Sodium is Na with a positive one charge. Phosphate is PO4 according to the periodic table, and phosphate has a minus three charge. So how do we put these together? Na3, we need three sodiums, but only one phosphate. And so therefore, this is sodium phosphate. How about sodium phosphide? Well, phosphide, ide is a typical ending. Phosphide is not a polyatomic ion if I look at that list. So phosphide must just be a phosphorus. So sodium is still plus one, phosphorus is minus three. So the formula for sodium phosphide is Na3P. You can recognize many polyatomics by their endings. Most don't end in ide. It's kind of the key concept from this slide. All right, last thought prompt. So thinking about the rules for naming. So we talked about the typical naming rule for ionic compounds is you name the metal, then the non-metal, and you end in ide. How does this rule change with transition metals and polyatomic ions according to what we just learned about? Well, transition metals use Roman numerals in the name. Normal ionic compounds don't, but if you see any of those transition metals or other metals that we don't know the charges of, we put a Roman numeral. So here's cobalt 2 chloride. Here, this cobalt has a charge of plus 2. Polyatomic ions, they change the name because typically the ending doesn't end in ide. We just use the name instead listed on the periodic table. Sometimes it does, but that depends on the name. So for example, calcium chlorite. Notice it's a little bit different than ide. It's chlorite. Calcium chlorite is a calcium right here. And then ClO2 on the periodic table is chlorite. And so this is calcium chlorite right there. All right, that ends our notes. You might want to take some moment now to review or highlight the key terms or important things that we learned from these slides. Take some time to ponder and ask questions and go back to the discussion post at the beginning of week and ask questions if you're still understanding or better yet, answer some questions if you really understand how things are working. Summarize by answering the essential question. Right? There's an essential question. See if you can deeply answer this question, making a claim, providing some evidence, and then explaining your reasoning. All right, good luck.